Good evening. Welcome to sleep chamber. It is what it is. What happens, happens. And as for now, there's nothing you can do. The streets, covered with rain. It was one of those nights that followed that one night. I was in a taxi, and it was one of those nights when I feel like I'm not really here. When I feel like I'm floating around. When I feel like I'm not really a part of the world around me. When I feel like I'm just a ghost, just a spirit, just a dream. I looked out the window and I saw the rain. I saw the rain and I thought about life. Thought about how life is just a series of moments. Moments that come and go. Moments that we can never get back. And in those moments, we are alive. In those moments, we are real. And then the moment is gone. And we are left with nothing but the memory of it. My thoughts were interrupted by the taxi driver. He asked me where I was going. I told him I didn't know. I just wanted to drive. I just wanted to feel the wind in my hair and the rain on my face. I wanted to feel alive. But the taxi driver pointed out that we were, in fact, in the inside of the car. Therefore, I couldn't possibly feel the wind in my hair and the rain on my face. He was right. But even though I couldn't feel the wind and the rain, I still felt alive. Because in that moment, I was real. I walked in the rain. I let the rain wash over me. I walked until I came to a park. And in that park, I saw a bench. And on that bench, there was a dog asleep. It was homeless. But it was alive. It was real. It mattered. I sat down on the bench and I watched the dog sleep. I watched it breathe. And in that moment, I felt alive. I felt real. I mattered. And I knew that even though the moment would soon be gone, the memory of it would stay with me forever. It was one of those moments that I'll never forget. I was sitting in my car, waiting for a friend, and I heard the bells begin to ring. Kenny, the janitor, was ringing the bells. But that day, for some reason, the sound of the bells was different. Sadder and more beautiful at the same time. I sat in my car and I listened to the bells ring out over the campus. And I thought about life and how everything is fleeting. How everything is just a moment that comes and goes. And how we are alive in those moments.
the pizza place on the corner. The smell of the pizza bacon in the oven. The sound of laughter. It was one of those moments that I'll never forget. I was sitting at a table with my friends, laughing and joking and having a good time. And then I smelled it. That unmistakable smell of pizza baking in the oven. My stomach grumbled and I realized that I was hungry. So, we ordered a pizza. But even more than that, it was the moment that mattered. The moment when we were all together, laughing and joking and enjoying each other's company. That's what I'll remember forever. This is holy ground. Really. The anchor of my feet. Love for life. Love for the world. And I knew in that moment that everything was going to be all right. Because we were alive, we were real. We mattered. A dash of hope, a touch of love. These are the things that make life worth living. These are the things that make us alive. In a perfect world, we would all be alive in every moment. But the world is not perfect. So instead, the moments that make us feel alive, and where we find those moments, we have to hold on to them. Hold on to them tight, because they are precious and they are few and they will soon be gone. I could tell you about a million moments like these. Moments that have stuck with me long after they've passed. Moments that have made me who I am today. But in the end, it all comes down to this. Life is just a series of moments. And in those moments, we are alive. In every kiss, we have only one life left and it is already happening right here all around us. The streets are dark and flowing with gold. The rain is falling and the colors are changing. What we once thought was a desert of darkness turns out to be an oasis, one that can offer us what our hearts have been yearning for all along, the promise of a better tomorrow. Will this be our chance? Can we make it through this storm together and come out the other side stronger than ever before? A dash of rain on my face, a bolt of lightning in the sky. The storm is coming but we are ready. I've got you buddy. Can you feel it? This is our time. I do what I feel. Have you gotten to your dream point yet? The place where matter loses its grip on you. From where you can dive deeply into the sea of your own soul and consciousness. You might ask yourself, what am I doing here? Why is this happening to me? And that's perfectly fine, because it means you're on the right track. The further you go, the more questions will arise. And that's a good thing. It means you're growing, 
expanding your awareness. There are no limits except for those we create in our minds. That feeling when all the pieces come together and everything makes perfect sense. That's how I feel right now. Like everything is finally falling into place. All the struggles, all the pain, it was all worth it because it led me to this moment. This magical, wonderful moment where I am exactly where I'm supposed to be. And nothing could make me happier. But it's not just happiness that I'm feeling. It's also a sense of peace. A deep inner peace that comes from knowing that everything is exactly as it should be. So whatever you're going through right now, whatever challenges you may be facing, just know that they are all part of your journey. They are leading you to something better. Something beautiful and amazing and worth fighting for. The best is yet to come. But at the moment, there's nothing you can do. Tomorrow or later in the day, you can accomplish some of what is on your table. But not now. My dream point is to be free from the chains of my past. I want to be able to fly away from everything that's holding me back and start fresh in a new place. A place where happiness is within reach and there's no such thing as impossible. So for now, I'm going to live this dream by taking it one second at a time. One step at a time. And eventually, why not live in those dreams now? Why not make them a reality right here and right now? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this moment and turn it into something magical. Something worth remembering for the rest of my life. And who knows? Maybe someday, someone will listen to this. And it will inspire them to do the same. To never give up on their dreams and to always believe in themselves. There's a thin line between dreams and reality. And sometimes, we have to blur that line in order to make our dreams come true. So let's do it. Let's turn this moment into something magical. I woke up to the sound of raindrops hitting the window pane. It was as if the storm outside was mirroring the storms inside my head, and for once, I found comfort in that thought. I got out of bed and walked to the window, watching as the rain fell down from the gray sky. People were hurrying around on the street below, trying to stay dry but failing miserably, and yet despite all that chaos, there was something strangely beautiful about it all. Eventually, I tore myself away from the window and got ready for the day. I had a lot of things to do, but for some reason, I didn't feel rushed or stressed. It was as if I knew that everything was going to work out somehow. And sure enough, throughout the course of the day, things did start falling into place. One by one, all my worries and fears began dissipating until there was nothing left but peace and calm. By the time night fell, I felt like a new person altogether. As I crawled into bed that night, I couldn't help but smile at how perfect everything had turned out. And in that moment, I realized that sometimes it takes a storm to remind us of what's truly important in life, not material possessions or worldly success, but our own happiness and well-being.
I'm sorry about nagging you about the well-being and safety. This is a podcast to help you fall asleep. I'll be silent for 10 seconds and rearrange my brain. At one time, when I was around 15 years old, I became very interested in learning how to be an actor. I'd always been fascinated by movies, but I never thought of them as a career option until one day when I saw an interview with Dustin Hoffman. He was talking about his craft and what it meant to him and something clicked inside me. For the first time, I realized that acting wasn't just about pretending to be someone else. It was about using your own life experiences and emotions to create a character that people could believe in. From that moment on, I knew that's what I wanted to do with my life. I started taking acting classes and doing a lot of research on the subject, watched interviews with actors and directors, and took notice of how they approached their work. Over time, I developed my own methods and techniques based on what I had learned, and although I'm still learning new things all the time, I feel like I've come a long way in developing my skills as an actor. But I still suck at it. You can laugh if you want, but it's true. I'm not the best actor in the world, by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, I'm probably one of the worst actors out there. But that doesn't mean I don't enjoy doing it. On the contrary, acting is one of my favorite things to do. It's just that every time I watch myself on screen or hear myself on tape, I can't help but cringe at how bad I am. But even though I know I'll never be a great actor, that doesn't stop me from trying. Acting isn't about winning awards or being adored by millions. It's about telling stories and bringing characters to life. It's about entertaining people and making them forget their troubles for a little while. And as long as there are people out there who appreciate what I do, no matter how terrible I might be, then I'll keep doing it. Either that, or I'm going to start a podcast that helps people fall asleep. My life is a weird place. It's full of strange people and even stranger things. But I love it here, because it's my home. And no matter how weird or wonderful this place might be, there's always something new to discover. Like that time I found a secret room in my house. I was exploring the attic one day, looking for some old boxes that I could use to store stuff in. But as I was rummaging around, I noticed something odd about the wall next to me. It looked like there was a door hidden behind some of the panels. So naturally, being the curious person that I am, started prying them open to see what was inside. And sure enough, there was a small doorway leading into another room. The weird thing is, I have no idea how long this secret room had been there. It could have been weeks, months, or even years. Finding it felt like uncovering a great mystery. I always wonder what other secrets this place might hold. Maybe one day might find out the secrets of being me, but until then, I'll just keep exploring and enjoying the ride. On the first day of this year, I made a resolution to myself. I will not make any more resolutions. It's not that I don't like setting goals or trying new things. It's just that, in my experience, New Year's resolutions tend to be more trouble than they're worth. They always seem like such a good idea at the time, but then never end up following through with them. And even if do manage to stick with it for a little while, it never feels like enough. So this year, instead of vowing to lose weight or save money, 
decided to simply resolve not to make any resolutions. It might sound silly, but so far it's been working out great. Not having any specific goals has freed me up to focus on enjoying life and taking things one day at a time. Who knows? Maybe this is the start of a brand new tradition. My non-resolution resolution. Have you gotten to your dream point yet? In the soft, bewildering velvet of the night, I take a step towards my dreams and never look back. I am the wanderer who has seen every tree, every creature that lurks within. And in my dreams, I have climbed to the top of the tallest mountain and looked out upon the vastness below, an ocean of possibility waiting to be explored. I have flown on wings of pure imagination, higher and faster than any bird or plane. I laugh with joyous abandon at all those who told me it was impossible. Trees become my friends as I swing from their branches, and the sun caresses my skin with warmth as I lay in its rays. I have been to places no one has ever been before, and seen things that no one has ever seen. And in those moments, I felt more alive than I ever thought possible. Her name was Lena and she was my dog. Lena was the best dog I ever had. She was a golden retriever. And she always seemed to know when I needed someone to just be there with me. Even though she could be lazy at times, she would always go on walks with me or play fetch whenever I wanted. She loved car rides and would get so excited that her whole body would wag back and forth. Whenever we went somewhere new, she would stick her head out the window and take everything in. It's like she knew that life was an adventure and wanted to make sure she missed nothing along the way. Lena passed away last year, but even now I still think about her all the time. She was such a special dog, and I miss her. Miss her so. I'm sorry for bringing up my deceased dog in our little night session. I don't plan what I'm going to talk about beforehand. Do you like animals? I can't say that I don't like animals, because there are some that I really do enjoy being around. But at the same time, I'm not exactly what you would call an animal person. I've never been one to go out of my way to seek out animal companionship. In fact, most of the animals in my life have come into it through other people. For example, when I was growing up, my family had a cat named Socks. He was mostly my sister's cat, but still spent a lot of time with him and grew very attached to him. Similarly, in college I had a roommate who owned a turtle. Although I wasn't particularly fond of turtles myself, I became quite fond of the roommate's turtle and enjoyed taking care of it while she was away. So even though I'm not actively seeking them out, Animals have always been present in my life in one way or another. Do you think humans will ever reach Mars? It's definitely possible. With all the advances we've made in technology over the past few decades, anything seems possible these days. Who knows? Maybe within our lifetime we'll see humans walking on Mars. I think it would be really interesting. It would be a whole new experience. And I think it would be great for humans to have a presence on another planet. However, there are also some challenges that come along with the idea of living on Mars. For example, how would we deal with the lack of air and water? There are definitely some small hurdles to overcome. 
but I think it's definitely possible that humans could one day call Mars home. Forever is a long time. Too long, if you ask me. I don't like the idea of forever. It's too much pressure. The thought of having to spend an eternity with someone is just too daunting for me. I prefer to take things one day at a time and not think about the future too much. After all, who knows what tomorrow will bring. So when people talk about finding their soulmate or getting married and spending the rest of their lives together, it just doesn't appeal to me. It sounds nice in theory, but in practice, no thanks. I'll stick with living in the moment and enjoying life as it comes. But then again, maybe that's just me. I often find that people are surprised by my views on love and relationships. So maybe I'm just not the romantic type. Who knows? Maybe one day I'll meet someone who changes my mind about forever. But until then, I think I'm happy living life one day at a time. Do you like the idea of forever, or does it scare you? Let me just remind you that I can't hear you. If you're answering, this is a podcast, pre-recorded. I won't be able to hear you. Do people ever really change? That's a complicated question. People can definitely change in some ways. But whether or not they actually do is another story. For example, someone might say that they want to quit smoking, but then never follow through with it. Or someone might claim to have changed their ways after spending time in jail, but then end up right back where they started. So it's hard to know for sure if people can truly change or not. I think the answer partly depends on the person and what kinds of changes they're trying to make. If somebody is trying to break a bad habit like smoking cigarettes, it might be easier for them to actually stick with it this time because they've made a conscious decision to do so. However, if somebody has been engaging in criminal behavior for years and suddenly decides that they want to go straight, it could be harder for them to maintain that change because old habits die hard. Ultimately, only the person themselves knows if they're capable of changing or not. All we can do is support them along the way. Now I'm going to tell you something else. You should not be afraid to ask questions. Because that is the only way you're going to get answers. And if you don't get answers, then you're never going to learn anything new. This world is full of mystery, and the only way to uncover its secrets is to ask questions. I don't mean to be bossy or anything, but just remember that the next time you're curious about something, go out and ask questions. My dad always used to say that the only stupid question is the one that isn't asked. So ask away. Again, I should remind you that this is a pre-recorded message and I am not actually here to answer your questions. People always say that the pen is mightier than the sword. And I believe that to be true. With a pen, you can write down your thoughts and feelings and share them with the world. Whatever you choose to do with it, remember that a pen is a powerful tool. So never underestimate its power. Pencils are also pretty cool. But that's a story for another time. Or maybe it's a story for now. I don't have any plans anyway. 
This is the story of the pencil that could talk. I know, I know, it sounds silly, but just bear with me for a second. This pencil was different than any other pencil in the world because this pencil could talk. This pencil could actually hold conversations with you. It knew everything about everything and was always happy to share its knowledge. The only problem was that no one believed that the pencil could really talk. They would laugh and call it names whenever it tried to engage them in conversation. But the truth is, even though they didn't believe the words coming out of the pen's mouth, deep down they were fascinated by its intelligence and a little bit scared too. One day, the pencil got fed up with being treated like a joke and it decided to leave. It didn't want to be around people who couldn't appreciate its gifts. So it set off into the world on its own. And without anyone there to sharpen it, it became nothing more than a useless stick. And that's when the pencil realized that maybe people weren't so bad after all. Maybe they were just afraid of something different. Something new. The moral of this story is unknown. At best, I don't know why I told it. Here's another story. The Tale of the Sarcastic Horse Once upon a time, there was a horse who was always making sarcastic comments. No matter what anyone said, the horse would find a way to say something that would make them look foolish. The other animals in the forest tolerated the horse's behavior because they knew that deep down, he didn't really mean any harm. But one day, the horse went too far and made a comment that hurt someone's feelings so badly that they ran away in tears. The other animals confronted the horse and told him how disappointed they were in him. They said that his sarcasm may have been funny at times, but it also caused pain and hurt people's feelings. The horse realized how wrong he had been and apologized to everyone for his behavior. From then on out, he tried to be more mindful of his words and only use his sarcasm for good instead of causing harm. The story doesn't end there, because the horse eventually continued to be sarcastic and ran into trouble again. And that's how the horse learned that sarcasm can be used as a weapon or a tool. It all depends on how you use it. Do you want to hear another story? Here is the saga of the blue frog who couldn't apologize. Once upon a time, there was a blue frog who did something very wrong. He knew that he had made a mistake and needed to apologize. But for some reason, the words just wouldn't come out of his mouth. No matter how hard he tried, he just couldn't say I'm sorry. The blue frog felt terrible about what he had done and wanted to make things right. But without being able to apologize, it seemed like an impossible task. He thought about giving up and never speak again so that people would forget about his mistake. But eventually realized that wasn't fair to anyone involved. So instead, he decided to write down an apology letter and hand deliver it to the person he hurt most by his actions. The act of finally apologizing helped the blue frog move on from what happened and learn from his mistake. And ultimately everyone involved was better off because of it. Of course this never happened. Because frogs can't talk or write and therefore not apologize in any form. Maybe in the shape of a croak. 
Have you reached your dream point yet? The place where shapes and form starts to move around in your void. No rush. Just asking. I can ask. This is my podcast after all. Last Tuesday, I went to the grocery store and saw a man who looked exactly like my father. It was so weird because my dad looks like no one else. Anyway, I went up to the man and asked him if he knew who I was. He said no, but we started talking anyway. We talked for hours about all sorts of things. And it was really nice. Eventually I had to go home. But before I left, I gave the man my phone number and told him to call me sometime. A few days later he called me and we made plans to meet up again next week. And that's when I realized that even though this man wasn't actually related to me by blood, he was still family in every way that mattered most. I guess he was my dad. I'm not sure. This is a story about two brothers who were always fighting with each other. No matter what they did, they could never seem to get along for more than a few minutes at a time. One day, after yet another heated argument, the younger brother stormed off into the forest and didn't come back for days. The older brother went looking for him. But no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't find his wayward sibling anywhere. The weeks turned into months, and still there was no sign of the younger brother. Just when the older brother had given up hope of ever seeing his little brother again, he heard a voice calling out to him from deep within the woods. Help. I'm lost. The older brother followed the voice until he found his little brother, who was trapped in a cave. The younger brother had been trying to find his way out for all this time, but without any success. The two brothers hugged each other and vowed to never fight again. They realized they were the best of friends, or at least until the day after, when the older brother threw a carrot at the younger brother's head during breakfast and they started arguing all over again. So, this podcast doesn't offer much in terms of structure. It's meant to listen to as a form of background noise as you try to escape your own mind. But with that said, you can do what you want with it. Today I had a really good day. I woke up and made myself breakfast. Then I went on a run. And it was really sunny out. After my run I showered and got ready for the day. Then I met up with some friends and we went to lunch. We had a great time talking and laughing together. After lunch we walked around town for a bit, then said goodbye. I came home feeling really happy today. But then it started to grow trees. In my room. I was so confused. Why would trees start growing in my room? Why would my day be so great, only to end with such a weird event? I don't know. But it was really strange. My mom came home from work and saw the trees, and she was just as confused as I was. We have no idea what caused it, but it was really weird. 
When I went to bed, I had a hard time falling asleep because I kept thinking about the trees in my room. And also, the tree branches were poking me in the face. It was a really strange day. The next day, I woke up and the trees were gone. It was like they had never been there in the first place. I was relieved, but also confused. Was it something I did? Or was it just a weird fluke? My neighbor, who is a professor in botany, came over and said that it was probably just a weird fluke. I'm still not sure what to believe. The trees had a smell, too. The leaves didn't look like normal leaves. They were a weird shape and color. Lion's belly. The professor told me to call the pattern on the leaves. Lion's belly. I don't know what that means. but it's a weird name for a leaf pattern. Not like I know a lot of other names for leaf patterns. I suck at botany. The sun and the wind came out of nowhere and stung us all in the face. We all laughed it off, shaking out our hair. It was the first time I'd seen her in a few weeks, and she was definitely more beautiful than before. She'd been out of town with her parents for the last month, but was finally back. The ride back to her place was fast and took no time at all. I left her at her apartment and promised to see her the next day. I was on my way home when my phone rang. I'm so sorry, I totally forgot to tell you. My parents are in town for the week and they want to meet you. I hung up the phone and turned around. I was going to have to go shopping. Whenever I look up, I sneeze. So I sneezed and at the same time I was thinking of a memory. A memory of when I was much younger. I was outside playing with my friends and we were laughing and having a great time. She was there. In my memory, this was the exact moment I fell in love with her. How could I have forgotten something like that? I guess I was just too caught up in the present to remember the past. The street felt different under my feet as I walked to her apartment. It was as if I was walking on air. I was so nervous. I had no idea what I was going to say to her parents. I knocked on the door and she answered it. Hey. She led me into the living room where her parents were sitting. They both stood up and her father held out his hand. It's nice to finally meet you. I'm Mr. Smith. Likewise, I'm Tom. We all sat down and they started asking me questions. Where was I from? What was my job? What were my hobbies? I answered them all as best as I could. I could tell that they approved of me and that made me feel good. After a while, they excused themselves and went to bed. She showed me to her room and we sat down on her bed. 
they're just a little overprotective. I leaned in and kissed her. It was a long kiss and when we finally pulled away, we were both breathless. I should go. I walked home with a smile on my face. I had a feeling that things were going to change for me. Youth. Even though it can be confusing and overwhelming, it's also a time when you're full of hope and possibilities. I'm glad it's over. And I hate that it is. I'm too old, and I've been around longer than most. I'm on that one swing that I always sit on. It's up there by the steps, the ones that they all climb up to get in. There's no one on it, and I'm too fat to jump. So I'm stuck up there, suspended in my swing, making wishes that my skin is tight. The sunlight hits me all happy and shiny, and I smell the lavender. Someone put some real fresh flowers in my hair. I look at them and see them dripping off, and I wish that it was me. I take the flowers and throw them out, just like any kid would do. Not like the magic lilies and tulips the lady upstairs leaves there. Her son died, I remember her talking about it. And she's going to be sad, like all of us are. I wish that life was like one of those lilies. Like lollipops. I wished for more days. and that my dad would give me a hug one more time. I wished that for a while he'd make us pancakes every morning. I closed my eyes and concentrated my forehead slinging back against the swing set. My elbows rubbing my shoulders and legs playing under the swing, making it vibrate. Then the wood was filled with its sound. It sounded like popcorn popping. Nails being hammered into a board. The roar of a jet engine. A baby crying. A crack of a whip. There was something so funny about it that I couldn't stop laughing. I couldn't even keep my head still. It was quiet and there was a goofy little smile on my face. Fred, you're messing up the wood. I didn't care. I kept laughing and laughing. My cheeks hurt, and I couldn't stop. He poked his head out from around the corner, his bangs still in front of his eyes. He put his hands on his hips. What's wrong, Fred? 
His voice was calm, no malice in it. His eyes were focused on me and it made me laugh harder. I looked down at him and he looked so sweet. He pointed up to the front door. I followed his hand and looked up. There was a light. The lady was standing in the window, looking at me. I ran over to the stairs and ran up. She was already unlocking the door. I ran through the house and into her arms. She hugged me tight. She took my hand and led me into the kitchen. She moved her face close to my ear. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, I repeated. She pushed me into the refrigerator. I'll get you a drink. She pulled out a jug of orange juice and poured some into a glass. Here, drink this. You're going to be okay. She brought me into a hug, held me close. It felt like a million tiny little hands were cupping my belly. I could feel something small and warm bouncing around. I'm so sorry. She held me until my breathing slowed and I stopped crying. I stood up and hugged her tightly. I leaned back on my seat and looked at the road. I could see Joseph's house up ahead and my heart started beating. I hope he doesn't mind that I took his car. I reached out my hand to the cabbie. Coffee time. See you later. He said and nodded towards my house. My heart sank as I walked towards the entrance. When did I become so comfortable? I walked up to the front door. One of these days, it's going to catch me and I'll never make it home in time. I took out my keys from my bag and slowly opened the door. Sarah was sprawled on the sofa reading a book. She raised her head as I walked in and I could see the happiness radiating out of her. She rose from her seat. Hi, honey. She came towards me, holding out her hands for a hug. I embraced her in an awkward embrace. It was as if we were strangers and were meeting after a gap of 20 years. Every spring the wind changes how I feel. It blows dust and leaves and grime and various bits of debris all over, starting with the windows and continuing all through the house. I hate cleaning, but I find that every spring I really, really want to. I want to clean everything and scrub down the house. I want to put everything away in its proper place. The task, if I can figure it out, is not so much to do the cleaning, but to hang up the pictures and arrange the furniture. What I hate most about cleaning is the time, wasting. I hate standing and thinking about what the ideal arrangement of the decorations would be. I hate dragging out more boxes to find what I want. I hate standing around, frustrated and mumbling, why can't I do it? I feel the same frustration over the piles of paperwork on my desk. I wonder how much longer it will be before I put everything away. Or how long it will take to get rid of everything.
I need to get rid of all the clutter in my life. He closed his eyes as the ball of light encircled his head and tickled it with tendrils of darkness. It was an image he hoped would fall away as he drifted off. But as he was swept away, the image appeared on his imagination, branded in his mind. He wanted to turn away, to look away, but it was a magic only a truly powerful person could possess. He felt helpless to control it, unable to hold it in his grasp, unable to stop it. The joy of the situation overwhelmed him. He wanted to laugh and cry, the emotions tearing at his heart and filling his mind until he couldn't hold back anymore. The light exploded in his head. Perfection is only a word. It's nothing you can use in real life. It's a word you use to describe something that's not really there. You can't live up to it. I'm floating in a pool of water. The sky is clear and blue. And the sun is shining. I can see digital characters swimming around me. And analog characters walking on the bottom of the pool. They are all wearing white clothes and have bright red eyes. I am not sure what is happening, but it feels very peaceful. I float around for a while, then wake up. When I wake up, I am in my room. I am not sure what the dream meant, but it was very strange. I'm not sure what to make of this dream. It was very peaceful, but the characters were strange. I'm not sure if it was a warning or something else. It's possible that the dream was symbolic of something going on in your life at the time. Perhaps you were feeling overwhelmed by technology or too much change happening all at once. Alternatively, it could be a sign that you need to take some time for yourself and relax. Whatever the case may be, it's important to pay attention to your dreams and try to interpret their meaning. Dreams can often give us clues about our subconscious thoughts and feelings. Do you have any dreams that you can't seem to forget? What do you think they mean? I have a lot of dreams that I can't forget. One dream in particular stands out to me. In the dream, I am walking through a dark forest. I see a bright light in the distance and start walking towards it. As I get closer, I realize that the light is coming from a large fire. By the fire, I can see people dancing. They are singing and clapping and seems to be enjoying themselves, and they don't see me. I get the feeling that I am not supposed to be there, and that I am not welcome. I try to leave, but no matter how hard I try, I can't seem to find my way out of the forest. 
This dream has stuck with me because it feels like it has a hidden meaning. I'm not sure what the message is, but it seems important. This dream could symbolize feelings of isolation or feeling like an outsider. It could also indicate that you are lost in your life and don't know which way to go. It is important to try to understand what your subconscious mind is trying to tell you. Dreams can often give us clues about our deepest thoughts and feelings. I am walking through a beautiful garden. The sun is shining and the flowers are blooming. I hear someone calling my name, but when I look around, there's no one there. Suddenly, a white rabbit appears and leads me down a path. The rabbit disappears and the door opens on its own. She steps inside and finds herself in front of an enormous throne made of solid gold. Sitting on the throne is a woman wearing a crown of diamonds who tells Alice she is now the Queen of Atlanta. That's weird, she says, and wakes up. Alice's dream could symbolize her feelings of being lost or confused in life. The garden could represent the many different paths she has to choose from, and the white rabbit could be a guide leading her towards her true destiny. Alternatively, this dream could simply be a reflection of Alice's desire to be in a position of power or control. Last night I dreamt I was in love with analogs, who entered the existence for a brief moment in time and then suddenly vanished. I loved them, but they kept vanishing, leaving me behind. I called, I begged, I pleaded, but they never answered. I'm not sure, I think it might be a type of person, or maybe something else entirely. All I know is that in my dream they were disappearing and I was left behind feeling heartbroken. It's also a beautiful name. What is the opposite of analog? The opposite of analog would be digital. A being that exists in a digital state or a being made up of data. So, in my dream, the analogs were disappearing and, perhaps, were replaced by digitals. No way to know for sure without asking the dreamer. In this case, me. This dream could symbolize your feelings of being left behind by change or progress. The analogs in the dream could represent something you are nostalgic for, or something that is disappearing from your life. Alternatively, it could be a warning to not get too attached to things because they might not stay the same. Because they might not stick around. A transistor is a semiconductor device that can be used as an amplifier or switch. They could represent progress or change happening in your life. Alternatively, they could be a symbol for something that is small but powerful. Today I built a transistor out of a dream. It wasn't hard. I started by finding a dream that had the right shape and size. I then used a knife to carefully cut it into the desired shape. Next, I drilled two small holes in the base of the transistor for the leads. 
Finally, I soldered the leads onto the holes and voila. A working transistor made out of a dream. It's really amazing what you can do when you set your mind to it. With a little creativity and effort, you can create just about anything you can dream up. Maybe one day you'll even be able to build a whole computer out of dreams. In order for a computer to be built out of dreams, you would need to be able to control the dreams. This would allow you to create circuits and components within the dream that would function in a similar way to their real-world counterparts. However, this technology is currently far beyond our capabilities. So for now, we'll have to settle for building transistors out of dreams. With a dream transistor, you can turn your dreams into reality. Just kidding. But transistors are pretty darn cool. Seriously though, transistors are amazing devices that are used in all sorts of electronic equipment. They can be used to amplify signals, switch circuits on and off, and even store data. So next time you're dreaming up some crazy invention, remember that you can probably build it as long as you have a dream transistor. Do you have a favorite dream? I'd love to hear about it. If you do decide to tell me a dream, remember this. The crazier the dream, the better. Sometimes the crazy lies in the smaller details. Like, in my dream, I was in a room with no doors or windows. The only way out was through a small hole in the ceiling. I dreamed that I was being chased by a giant chicken through a maze made of jello. This dream could symbolize feelings of anxiety or insecurity in your waking life. The giant chicken may represent something or someone that is threatening or overwhelming to you, while the jello maze could represent the confusing and uncertain path ahead of you. Alternatively, this dream may simply be a reflection of your fear of chickens. The boy was walking along a path through a field when he suddenly came upon a large door. He opened it and walked inside. The door closed behind him and he found himself in what appeared to be a huge castle. He began to explore, but the more he looked, the more confused he became. Nothing seemed to make sense. Suddenly, he heard someone calling his name. He followed the voice until he came to a room where an old man was sitting in a chair by a fire. The man told the boy that he was dreaming and that everything would become clear soon. The boy sat down and listened as the old man began to speak. As the old man spoke, the boy gradually began to understand what was happening. He realized that he was dreaming and that the dream would soon end. The old man told him not to be afraid and that everything would be all right. The boy thanked the old man for his help and then woke up. He felt much better now and knew that he could handle whatever came next in his dream. This story has a moral about facing your fears and trusting that things will work out in the end. It is also a reminder that we all have our own inner wisdom to guide us through difficult times. The boy in this story is facing a fear of the unknown. He is exploring a new place and doesn't know what to expect. The old man represents his inner wisdom and helps him to see that there is nothing to be afraid of. This story reminds us that we all have the ability to face our fears and trust that things will work out in the end. One day a seagull went to the supermarket. 
He saw all the food and wanted to try it all. He started with the bread, then moved on to the vegetables. He tried a little bit of everything and was really enjoying himself. The seagull was having so much fun that he didn't even notice when the store manager came up to him. The manager asked him what he was doing and the seagull explained that he was just trying out all the food. The manager thought for a moment and then said, You know, we get a lot of complaints about birds making messes in our store. I'm going to have to ask you to leave. The seagull apologized and flew away. I arrived at the shipyard early in the morning, eager to get started on my latest project. The sun was just starting to peek over the horizon, casting a pink and orange glow across the sky. I could hear the sound of waves crashing against the docks and seagulls squawking in the distance. As I walked towards my workstation, I saw some of my co-workers already hard at work. We exchanged brief pleasantries before getting down to business. For the next few hours, we worked diligently on our project, stopping only for quick breaks now and then. The time flew by and soon it was lunchtime. We took a break to eat our packed lunches overlooking the water. It was a beautiful day out and we all agreed that there's nothing quite like working by the sea. After lunch, we got back to work and soon enough it was time to call it a day. We tidied up our workstations and said goodbye to each other until tomorrow. I walked out of the shipyard feeling satisfied with a job well done. It's days like these that make me love my job even more. Looking back, I can say without a doubt that it was one of the best days at the shipyard. Even though it was a long day, I went home with a smile on my face, knowing that I had contributed to something great. I can't wait to see the finished product. My dad was always a bit of a mischief maker. So, when he saw a horse grazing in a field near our house, he couldn't resist trying to steal a snack from the unsuspecting animal. He crept up behind the horse and reached out to grab some of its food. But the horse must have sensed something because it suddenly turned around and kicked my dad square in the stomach. He went flying backwards and landed with a thud on the ground. Lesson learned, never mess with a horse's lunch. The next day, my dad was telling me about his latest adventure. You won't believe what happened to me yesterday, he said with a chuckle. I tried to steal a snack from a horse, and it kicked me right in the stomach. I just shook my head and laughed. I should have known better than to expect anything else from my dad. My name is Bruce and today was just an ordinary day. I woke up at 7 a.m., had breakfast and then went to work. I had a lot of paperwork to do and some phone calls to make. I left work at 5 p.m. and drove home. On the way home, I stopped at the grocery store to pick up some dinner. I made myself a sandwich when I got home and then watched TV for a while. I went to bed around 10 p.m., and that was pretty much it for my day. And I also got to meet some aliens with pink sweatshirts and big heads. They were really friendly and we had a great time talking about life on their planet. It was definitely the highlight of my day. Anyway, that's all for today. I hope tomorrow is just as eventful. But probably not. Stuff never happens to me. Corn is one of the most versatile and widely grown crops in the world. 
though it originated in Central America. Today, corn is grown on every continent except Antarctica. In the United States, corn is a key ingredient in many foods, including tortillas, chips, cereals, and popcorn. It is also used to make ethanol fuel and animal feed. There are more than 30 varieties of corn grown around the world. The two main types are sweet corn and field corn. Sweet corn is the type that people eat as a vegetable. It has high levels of sugar which give it its sweetness. Field corn includes all other types of maize. It is used for livestock feed or to make products like biofuels and corn flakes cereal. Maize was first domesticated by indigenous peoples in Mexico about 10,000 years ago. It was then brought to Europe by Spanish explorers in the 16th century and from their spread to Africa and Asia. Today, China is the largest producer of maize, followed by India and Brazil. The United States produces both sweet corn and field corn. In fact, one third of the world's supply of field corn comes from America. The majority of U.S. corn crop is used for animal feed or to make ethanol fuel, with only a small amount being grown for human consumption. Corn is a relatively easy crop to grow. It thrives in warm climates with long growing seasons and can be planted using various methods, including manual labor or mechanized equipment. The plant has both male and female parts, which means that it can pollinate itself Once the ears of corn are mature, they are harvested by hand or machine and then either eaten fresh or processed into other products. Whether you love it roasted on the cob, popped at the movies, or fermented into your favorite beverage, there's no denying that corn plays a big role in our lives. The wind is a vital force on our planet. It shapes weather patterns, determines the distribution of ocean currents, and influences the climate. The Earth rotation causes different parts of the atmosphere to move at different speeds, resulting in areas of high and low pressure. These pressure differences create winds. The world's prevailing winds blow from west to east across the equator. This pattern results from the differential heating of the Earth's surface by the sun. Warm air rises near the equator, while cooler air sinks towards the poles. Winds play an important role in determining both local and global climate patterns. Winds transport moisture from one place to another which ultimately affects precipitation patterns. I love the wind. Have you reached dream state yet? No worries. It's okay if you haven't. Jupiter is the fifth planet from the Sun and the largest in the solar system. It is a gas giant with a mass one thousandth that of the Sun, but two and a half times that of all the other planets in the solar system combined. Jupiter has been known to astronomers since antiquity. It is named after the Roman god Jupiter, who was also god of thunder and lightning. Jupiter was observed by Chinese and Babylonian astronomers as early as 7th or 8th century BCE. In 1610, Galileo Galilei became perhaps first person to see Jupiter through a telescope when he discovered its four largest moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto.
By observing their orbital motions over several nights, Galileo showed they were not simply stars near Jupiter but were actually orbiting it. This discovery also meant that there must be at least one more planet beyond Saturn, which up until then had been considered farthest away from Sun. Here are some key things to know about our solar system's reigning king. Despite being mostly gas and clouds, Jupiter does have a small rocky core thought to be about 10, 15 times Earth's size. However, it is much less dense than our home world due mainly because it consists mostly of hydrogen compounds like water vapor and methane rather than rock minerals. Above this layer lies what scientists refer to as molecular hydrogen, an extremely hot ocean where electrons have been stripped from atoms creating an electrically conducting soup conducive for generating strong magnetic fields. These conditions are thought necessary for supporting life, so some researchers believe habitable worlds might exist hidden beneath Jovian clouds. As evidence suggests most if not all stars form with accompanying planets, Many planetary scientists now think our own solar system isn't unique, but rather typical. Meaning there could be billions of other worlds like ours scattered throughout Milky Way galaxy alone. Jupiter's great red spot is a giant hurricane-like storm that has been raging for at least 400 years. It is large enough to easily accommodate Earth within its confines and could possibly even swallow up our planet whole. The rhino stood in the middle of the forest, looking up at the stars. It was a clear night, and the sky was full of them. They twinkled and shone, and the rhino felt like they were trying to tell him something. But what could they be saying? The rhino thought about this for a long time, but he couldn't figure it out. Maybe the stars were just pretty things that didn't mean anything. Or maybe they were trying to tell him something important, but he just couldn't understand it. The rhino sighed and lay down on the ground, gazing up at the stars again. He would keep looking until he figured out their meaning. After all, there must be some reason why they existed. As he stared at the stars, the rhino slowly began to feel like he was understanding them. They weren't just pretty things, they were part of something much bigger. The universe was full of mystery and wonder, and the stars were just a small part of it. The rhino felt awe and humility as he realized how tiny he was in comparison to the vastness of the cosmos. But even though he was small, he mattered. He existed for a reason, and his life had meaning. The stars twinkled down at him, as if telling him that everything was going to be all right. And in that moment, the rhino knew that they were right. He had finally found the meaning of the universe. The rhino stood up and walked back to his home, feeling at peace with the world. I hope this letter finds you well. I am writing to tell you about my life since we last saw each other. It's been a few years since we were together in the city and so much has happened since then. I moved away from the city and got married. I had a baby girl and she is the light of my life. 
My husband is a good man, but he doesn't understand me like you did. I often think about our time together and how special it was to me. I know it wasn't easy for either of us at times, but we made it through because we loved each other deeply. We shared something rare and beautiful, and I will be forever grateful to you for that. I hope you are happy and doing well too. There's so much in the world that confuses me. Time, for instance. How can something move so fast and then slow down and speed up again? It's like trying to catch a cloud. But I suppose that's what life is, isn't it? A series of moments, some which we wish could last forever and others which pass by in the blink of an eye. But even though time is often confusing, there's one thing I am sure of, and that's my love for you. It has been constant since the day we met and will continue long after this letter reaches you. So whatever else happens in this strange world we live in, just know that my love for you will never change. It is as strong now as it was the day we met. With all my love, your girl, Soil is the stuff of life. It's where we grow our food, build our homes, and find refuge from the elements. It's also a vital part of the water cycle, filtering and purifying water as it seeps through its pores. Soil is alive with billions of microbes that help to break down organic matter and release nutrients for plants to uptake. Soil is essential for human survival. Without it, we would starve or thirst to death within days. Yet despite its importance, soil is often taken for granted or seen as nothing more than dirt. We need to respect and protect this precious resource so that future generations can continue to benefit from its many gifts. Soil is a complex and fascinating subject worthy of further study and appreciation. Who knows what secrets this humble substance may yet reveal? Soil, soil, the miraculous soil. The foundation of life, the giver of all things good and pure. Without you we would perish, you are essential to our survival. Yet you are often taken for granted or seen as nothing more than dirt but there is so much more to you than meets the eye. You're alive with billions of microbes that help break down organic matter and release vital nutrients for plants to uptake. You play a crucial role in the water cycle by filtering and purifying water as it seeps through your pores. And you provide us with food, shelter and protection from the elements. In short, without you we would be lost. So let us take a moment to appreciate all that you do for us. Let us show some respect and care for this precious resource so that future generations can continue to benefit from your many gifts. For soil is truly a wondrous thing, complex, fascinating and full of surprises. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Dreams are the things that we see when we're asleep. Or at least that's what they're supposed to be. Sometimes they're happy and sometimes they're sad. But usually they don't make much sense. They can be about anything, big or small. And oftentimes they're just a jumble of random thoughts. But even though they may not always mean much, 
dreams are still special because they come from our minds. And who knows what goes on inside our heads better than ourselves? So even though they may be strange and confusing, we should still cherish our dreams because they're a part of who we are. Dreams are the things that we see when we're asleep. Or at least that's what they're supposed to be. Sometimes they're happy and sometimes they're sad. They can be about anything, big or small. And oftentimes they're just a jumble of random thoughts. But even though they may not always mean much, dreams are still special because they come from our minds. Dreams are a part of who we are. Or at least that's what they claim to be. Sometimes they're fuzzy and sometimes they're weird. But usually they don't make much sense. They can be about anything, sad or joyful. And oftentimes they're just a jumble of random thoughts. But even though they may not always mean much, they come from our minds. And who knows what goes on inside our heads better than ourselves. So even though they may be strange and confusing, we should still cherish our dreams because dreams are a part of who we are. Who we are is amazing. You are amazing. You, the listener, who is trying to fall asleep in a world filled with noise. I generally go to bed around 10 p.m. I read for a bit before sleep, usually fiction that I enjoy but isn't too intellectually demanding. Sometimes I'll listen to an audiobook if it's something particularly gripping. Once in a while I have trouble falling asleep, in which case I'll get up and do some quiet activity like reading or crossword puzzles until I'm tired enough to sleep again. I generally wake up between 6.30 and 7 a.m. If my boyfriend is still asleep, I try not to make too much noise so as not to disturb him. Though he's a pretty heavy sleeper so this usually isn't an issue. Otherwise, I start getting ready for the day, showering, doing my hair and makeup, etc. On weekdays, once I'm all ready for the day, I head downstairs and fix myself breakfast before sitting down at my desk to start work. Breakfast is often followed by going back upstairs to snuggle with my boyfriend for another hour or two before we finally get out of bed and start our day. Once I'm up and about, my night habits are pretty much the same regardless of what day it is. I'll usually have lunch around 1 p.m., followed by some more work and dinner around 6-7 p.m. After that, I typically spend some time relaxing, watching TV, browsing the internet. There are of course variations to this routine. Sometimes I'll go out to dinner with friends or family, or have other plans that require me to be up and about later in the evening. But for the most part, this is a pretty accurate depiction of my nightly habits. And I feel heartbroken. The moon loves all of Earth's creatures. It watches over them as they sleep, and it lights up their way when they wake. It is always there for them, whether they are happy or sad. The moon knows that each creature on Earth is special and has its own story. It has seen them all grow and change, and it has shared in their joys and sorrows. The moon loves each creature equally, for they are all part of the great cycle of life. The moon knows that one day they will all return to the earth from whence they came. Until then, the moon will continue to shine down on them, 
sending them its love every night. Dear creatures of Earth, never forget that the moon loves you. Always remember that you are never alone, for the moon is always with you, with love. I sit in my room and I think about the world and how frustrating it is that I don't understand it. Why is everything so complicated? Why can't I just figure things out? I feel like I'm always behind. Like everyone else knows something that I don't. It's so aggravating. And sometimes people act like they know what they're talking about when they clearly don't, which makes me even more frustrated. Why can't somebody just explain everything to me? Make it all clear. But that's never going to happen. Is it? Because life isn't fair and the world is a confusing place. Maybe one day I'll understand it all. Or maybe not. Either way, for now, I'll just have to deal with the frustration of not understanding the world around me. I just wish it was easier. But it isn't. And that's the way it is. My brother says that life is like a box of chocolates but I don't really get that analogy. What does it even mean? The history of pies and pineapples is a long and delicious one. Pie is a type of pastry that consists of an outer crust and filling. The earliest pies were made with wheat flour, water and fat. This dough was then filled with fruit or meat before being baked in an oven. Pies have been around since the ancient Egyptians, who are thought to have invented them. In fact, the word pie is derived from the Latin word for magpie, which was a kind of bird that was known for its love of food. Pies then spread to Europe, where they became popular amongst the nobility. Pineapples are native to South America and were first introduced to Europe by Christopher Columbus in 1493. However, it wasn't until much later that they became widely available as fresh fruit. Prior to this, they were only used as decorations or in sweet dishes such as pies. Nowadays, there are all sorts of different pies and pineapples are often used as a key ingredient in both sweet and savory dishes alike. Whether you enjoy eating them or simply admire their beauty, there's no doubt that these two things have become firmly entrenched in our culture, just like pie crusts and pineapple tops. So next time you're tucking into a slice of pie or enjoying a juicy pineapple, spare a thought for the long and delicious history that these foods have. Who knows? Maybe one day your descendants will be doing the same. The prince was walking through the forest when he came across a strange princess. The princess was very weird and the prince thought she was quite odd. However, he decided to talk to her anyway. They talked for a while and the prince found out that the princess was actually quite normal, despite her weird appearance. The prince and the weird princess continued talking and eventually became friends. The prince invited the princess to come back to his castle with him and she accepted. The two of them lived happily ever after. Or so you'd think, the couple's relationship was anything but perfect.
the princess was always doing weird things that made the prince uncomfortable, like eating bugs or talking to herself. However, the prince loved her anyway and they remained friends until the day she decided to leave him for another prince. Amazing. I mean, what are the odds? The prince was heartbroken when the weird princess left him, but he soon found another princess who was even weirder than the first one. He thought this new princess was perfect for him and they got married. However, it turns out that she was just as strange as the first princess and the prince soon realized that he had made a mistake. Despite this, the prince decided to stay with his new wife and try to make things work. It wasn't easy, but eventually they managed to find some common ground and their relationship became somewhat more stable. However, there were still times when the prince would catch his wife doing something weird that would make him uncomfortable. Overall, though, things worked out all right for the prince and his two weird wives. He learned to love them both in spite of their quirks and they all lived happily ever after. Until one day, when the prince woke up to find that his new wife had left him during the night. The prince was devastated, but he soon realized that it was for the best. He wasn't meant to be with someone who was so strange and unpredictable. The prince learned his lesson and vowed never to marry again until he met a woman who was even weirder than the first two princesses. The moral of this story is that you should never judge a book by its cover. I had a dream last night that I was walking through a forest, and there was this gigantic mushroom. The mushroom was so big that it dwarfed the trees around it, and its cap was covered in all sorts of different fungi. Some of the fungi were brightly colored, while others were more subdued. I reached out to touch the mushroom, and as soon as my hand made contact with it, the entire thing dissolved into thin air. I woke up feeling really strange, like something important had just happened but I couldn't quite remember what it was. After lying in bed for a few minutes trying to recall the details of the dream, I gave up and got out of bed. As soon as my feet hit the floor, I knew something was wrong. The whole room looked different somehow, like it wasn't really real. I walked over to the window and looked outside. Instead of seeing my street and neighbors' houses like usual, there was only an endless expanse of white nothingness stretching out in every direction. It was almost like being inside one giant cloud. Or maybe a cotton candy machine gone haywire. A feeling of wonder began to well up inside me as I realized that whatever had happened during my sleep must have been pretty serious indeed. I decided to go outside and explore this strange new world I found myself in. As soon as I stepped out the front door, I was hit with a blast of frigid air. It was so cold that my breath came out in little white puffs, and my skin prickled with goosebumps. Despite the cold, I felt really excited as I began walking through the featureless landscape. After a while, I started to feel lightheaded and dizzy like I had been walking for hours without taking a break. A soothing voice suddenly spoke to me then, telling me to lie down and rest. I did as the voice said, and before I knew it, I was fast asleep. When I next woke up, I was back in my room with the sun shining in through the window. At first I thought that maybe it had all been a dream, but then I noticed the frosty coating on my windowsill and realized that it had really happened. That's when it hit me. The giant mushroom from my dream must have been some kind of portal into another world. And somehow, during my sleep, I must have stepped through it. The thought of all the possibilities that awaited me in this new world was too much to resist, so I got dressed and headed back outside. Even though I knew it would be cold, I couldn't help but smile as I stepped into the unknown once again. 
As I walked through the door of my home, I found myself in a dense forest. The trees were so tall that they blocked out most of the sunlight, and the ground was covered in a thick layer of leaves and moss. It was eerily quiet, and there wasn't a single animal or person in sight. I had no idea where I was or how I got there, but something about this place felt strangely familiar. As I continued walking, I began to notice strange markings on some of the tree trunks. They looked like symbols or letters, but I couldn't read them. Eventually, I came across a small clearing in the forest with a large boulder in the center. And sitting on top of the boulder was none other than the giant mushroom from my dream. The moment I laid eyes on it, memories from my dream came flooding back to me. This must be the portal into another world that the voice had spoken about. As soon as my hand made contact with it, the entire world around me dissolved into thin air. I felt myself falling through a tunnel of light, and then everything went blank. The next thing I knew, I was standing in front of a huge palace made of white marble. It looked like something out of a fairy tale, and it was so beautiful that it took my breath away. I began walking towards the palace, but before I could reach the entrance, two enormous guards appeared out of nowhere and barred my way. They were twice my size and had intimidating features, but I didn't back down. I need to speak with your king or queen, I said confidently. It's very important. The guards just stared at me for a moment before one of them finally spoke. You cannot enter unless you pass our test, he said in a deep voice. If you can answer our riddles correctly, then you will be allowed inside. I agreed to the guard's challenge, and he proceeded to ask me a series of increasingly difficult riddles. I managed to answer them all correctly, much to the surprise of the guards, and they finally allowed me inside the palace. As soon as I stepped through the entrance, I was met with a scene of complete chaos. The floors were littered with broken furniture and shattered glass, and there were dozens of people running around screaming and shouting. It looked like some kind of riot was taking place. In the midst of all this mayhem was a group of soldiers who were trying unsuccessfully to contain the crowd. They saw me standing there and immediately came over, demanding to know what I was doing there. Before I could answer, somebody in the crowd shouted that I was an intruder from another world who had come to overthrow their king or queen. As soon as those words left his mouth, everyone started booing and jeering at me angrily. The soldiers grabbed hold of me then and dragged me away towards a set of large double doors at the far end of the room. The doors opened into a grand throne room, and seated on the throne was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. She had long flowing hair and piercing blue eyes, and she was wearing a dress made of shimmering silk. Next to her stood a man who I assumed was her husband, the king. He wasn't as handsome as she was, but he still looked regal in his robes of state. Who are you? The queen asked me in a cold voice. And what do you want? I took a deep breath before answering her. My name is Alice, I said slowly. And I've come from another world to warn you about an impending triumph. What are you talking about? The king demanded. I'm sorry, I said, shaking my head. But I don't have time to explain everything right now. Suffice it to say that there is a great triumph coming your way, and you need to be prepared for it. The queen and king exchanged a worried look, and then the latter spoke again. Very well, he said with a sigh. We will hear what you have to say. But first, you must pass our test. Just like the guards outside, the king proceeded to ask me a series of riddles, and once again, I managed to answer them all correctly. After I had passed the test, the queen beckoned me closer and asked me to tell her more about this impending triumph. So I did. I told her everything I knew about the triumph of my fungus. And so I reached dream state. 
I was sleeping 